Okay, so um, as Terry mentioned, my, my background is in, in physical oceanography, and so um, I've been doing a lot of work for really the past decade looking at um, the oceanography of, of coral reefs and the oceanography of, of um, tropical uh, marine ecosystems. And what I really want to talk about um, today is, is work looking at what drives temperature variability in reefs um, and, and reef, reef heat budgets, and really focus on the role that the tides play in driving the, this variability. And I'll talk about two scales. So one is the, the regional scale, so you know, 100 to 1200 kind of scales, uh, down to the scale of individual um, reefs. Okay, so what I wanna, just for some context, um, you know, if we think about your sort of classic, you know, reef um, places like Ningaloo, um, uh, parts of the Great Barrier Reef, the, the Pacific Islands, a lot of these areas receive a lot of wave exposure, and, and if we think about what drives currents, what drives the circulation of these, these reefs, it's largely um, waves. Um, but there's a lot of reefs, um, and I'll show you a lot of reefs throughout the world that re receive you know, strong tides. Um, pretty much throughout northern Australia, so northwestern Australia and, and the northern GBR are, are good examples, but there's, there's others. And you can see sort of these, this is a spectacular case in the Kimberley, which I'll talk about today, where um, you get really large tides with these intertidal um, <clears throat> reef platforms. Okay, so the focus of this talk is, the first part is really to look at some of the, the dynamics and the processes that occur in these um, tidally forced um, reefs. And so one of the first things we wanted to do is just understand how um, important these are, are globally. So, you know, some work we did initially was looked at all the warm water um, tropical reef systems globally and um, looked at the, the tidal conditions they experience and also, you know, from wave models, what the, the average um, wave conditions they experience. And you can see um, here, this is the, the red areas are where we get essentially large tides, as I talked about northern Australia. Um, places like East Africa, Southeast Asia, parts of Central America. And, and these are areas where the, the tides are much greater than waves. So if we think about, and I'll, and I'll show the circulation, what drives um, temperature variations is, is strongly linked in with, with how tides behave in these environments. And these are also very you know, poorly studied reefs globally. If we think about you know, a lot of these areas like um, the Kimberley and Northwest Australia are very remote. And, um, and so in terms of the, the motivation, um, you know, one of the, the key um, elements of why we do this is to understand what, what is actually happening at the scale um, in reefs. And, and there's a lot of evidence um, in the last decade or so that show that the environmental variability that occurs um, in, um, at the, you know, within reefs can be very um, substantial. And so if we want to actually in the future project what's happening to, to reefs where we're relying heavily right now on um, global climate models that, that are you know, simulated the ocean and atmosphere processes at, at really scales that are hundreds of kilometers, so they're nowhere near resolving um, <clears throat> individual reefs. But even if we think about you know, monitoring like satellite products that we rely on for monitoring reefs, you know, we're talking kilometer scale or tens of kilometer. Um, <clears throat> and so we're not resolving individual reef uh, processes. Um, and so if we, we think about, as I'll show just one example, you know, this is, this is Ningaloo, where we can see really dramatic variations in, in, in this case, temperature, even at the scales of tens to hundreds of meters of reefs. Um, so if we're thinking about, you know, mean temperature increases um, globally of, you know, say two, two degrees, three degrees, or, or depending on different scenarios, um, <clears throat> we can also look at individual reefs like, like Ningaloo, um, and this is showing the temperature difference between offshore and these, these sites in the reef. Um, and the basic idea is that as water, in this case, waves are driving the circulation in Ningaloo. <clears throat> so as water um, you know, flows through the reef, it's a shallow reef, so the, you can have heat from the atmosphere that can either warm in the summer. So, um, so you can see in the summer you can get the temperature between onshore and, and off the reef you know, for several periods of, you know, several days, you know, the time can be, you know, two, three degrees warmer. Um, Ningaloo is an interesting case because it gets really strong easterly, really cool um, atmospheric um, events in the, in the winter. And so you can see, you know, the temperatures in the back reef areas can be, you know, six degrees cooler. 
cooler. So, so there's a lot of local processes that are important to just kind of understand if we want to project um, and understand how these temperature regimes will change in the, in the future. Okay, so what I want to do is um, really two parts to the talk. The first is um, the focus is really talking about some of the, the dynamics of these um, tide-dominated reefs. Um, the first thing, I just want to talk about how in these um, reef environment, what drives the, the, the circulation, water level variability, essentially the, the movement of water on and off these, um, these reefs. And I'll focus on the Kimberley, um, a case study. We've done a lot of work on, on, a, on a few reefs there. I'll talk about one in particular. Um, and use this to kind of develop um, general kind of models to predict the, these dynamics. Um, then with this information, um, the second part of that is, is to look at the sort of interesting interplay between how tides and solar heating cycles can interact and drive temperature variability. So, and then finally, this is more the work in progress, is um, just briefly, you know, towards the end, I'll talk about on, on regional scales what the role of how tides are um, in terms of driving a lot of the, the, the temperature variability over, over regional scales, um, and talk specifically about the, the El Nino event in the Kimberley in um, particular. Okay, so I realize probably a lot of you aren't familiar with the Kimberley. Um, just wanted to provide some, some background. So the Kimberley is up in far northwestern Australia. Um, it's, it's interesting in that it experiences one of the largest tidal ranges in the world. Um, in, in, in some locations up to 10 meter um, ranges. It's a semi-diurnal tide, so on top of this big tidal range, you have the tide, you know, essentially have two low tides. Sorry to interrupt, yeah. but um, you brought to my attention that UWA are trying to connect to us. Uh, um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Green, they both put out a tweet one minute ago saying, can you connect to them? Yeah. You know who that is? Probably Karen. No, Rebecca Green. Oh, Rebecca? She's with you. Yeah. I don't know, I can, I can give them the slide. I can give the talk when I go back. Well, that's what I was thinking. You, didn't you just come from there? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. If you don't care, that's fine. Well, I'll don't say that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so there's numerous um, reef systems um, throughout the, the Kimberley, and, and there's really um, you know, it's still poorly studied in many ways, but there's some estimates that there's about 2,000 of these individual islands or more, uh, many with fringing reefs, and really there's been a huge knowledge gap until, um, besides sort of surveys by the museum and, and others, until recently there's been a, a lot of uh, research now devoted to understanding the, the Kimberley marine environment, in large part by the decision of the, the state government to set up a number of marine parks that you know, it's often referred to as this great Kimberley Marine Park, so a massive area. Um, and through this, um, this is West Australian Marine Science Institution. They formed this Kimberley Marine Research Program, which is some of this work that I'll talk about is, is, is. So there's a lot of activity in, the, in, in people studying the, the Kimberley. So these are you know, very spectacular reef environments, and there's probably a lot of analogies to the, you know, the far northern um, GBR. Um, as, as well, where you get really strong tidal flows, really large tides. Um, and we've done a lot of work, for those who've been to Broome, um, if you go about 200 kilometers north, um, this is um, King Sound, and, and right near the entrance, there's a number of, um, so this is the, the Buccaneer Archipelago, um, and there's a reef, Tallinn Island, we've been studying quite a bit, so I'll talk mostly about Tallinn um, today. But it's very typical of a lot of these reefs where what you can see is the depth profiles across the reef here, and you can see it rises out of really deep water, you know, um, 60 or so meters. Um, the, the top of the reef is you know, incredibly flat, very wide platform that's about you know, one and a half kilometers wide. And these dotted lines here are the low tide, um, average low tide and the, the average high tide limit. So at low tide, these reefs essentially come out of the, the water. Um, so very large tides. And just to show, um, <clears throat> you know, this is showing a time lapse of, um, you know, showing the start of low tide in the morning. And so we had a, one of these experiments, we had a, 
plat like an observation platform, and you can see, so you get essentially this water ponding. This is a, a back reef environment where you, you, know, you have seagrass and, and algal communities, there's coral communities on the, the, the crest, but you can see the you know, water rising, so starting at you know, half a meter for long periods of the day and then rising to you know, three, four meters um, at, at, at high tide. Um, so one of the, the first things we, we did is we really wanted to understand what drives water level variation, what drives, you know, how does, um, what controls how water drains and, and falls off this reef, and I'll show why it's important. So we've, um, we did a large um, field experiment where we measured essentially currents, profiles at all of these red dots here, and then um, measured water levels at these yellow points. And I won't go into all the details, but have a paper which describes you know, this, this reef system and then, you know, general kind of processes that occur in these, um, these tide-dominated reef environments. And one of the, the main things I just want to show is, is how different the, the tidal variations are on these, on these reefs. So it's a bit difficult to see here, but what you can see if we look at um, the, the, sorry to say, blue lines here is the, the water levels measured offshore. And then you can see the, this P9, this brownish color. You can see the, the tidal ranges on top of the reef. And so the tidal variations on the reef are much, much smaller. So this is what we call um, tidal truncation. And if we focus um, specifically on here, the, the water level. So this is offshore variations. This is one tidal cycle and then showing the, the, how water varies on the reef. And essentially, you have water as the tide floods. It, once it goes over the, the Top of the reef, you just get a really rapid flood, so you get really strong flows, really strong currents um, across the reef. But on the ebb tide, on the falling tide, you can see the water you know, essentially just drains very, very slowly. It just trickles off. And, and the tide, the interesting thing is the tide's actually rising for only two hours. It's falling for, for 10 hours. Um, and so you get these you know, really elongated um, cases where you get this water essentially pooling or ponding up on this reef. Um, for, for long periods of, the, of time. And so we've done a lot of, I'm going to walk through the details about all the sort of the mechanics of why that happens, but um, there's just in simple sense, there's really two things that happen. So we have these really wide reef platforms that have a lot of roughness, a lot of rugosity. Um, essentially, as the water drains and falls off this reef, there's a lot of resistance to that flow. And so the water essentially takes a long time for that water to drain off the reef. So, so based on the morphology and the roughness characteristics and the tidal conditions, um, what's interesting is that the water levels could fall really far, fall far below the reef, but we always end up with you know, a reasonable amount of water um, trapped on the reef um, platform. And so this is just showing some um, model kind of predictions that we developed in this paper, just showing going from high tide, how the water decays on the reef, and you can see that how it decays really depends on how rough the, the actual reef is. So, so this interesting kind of feedback between um, the morphology and the roughness characteristics and how you know, water is able to stay um, trapped on these reef. So there's um, not a great deal of work on, on, on these kind of detailed measurements, but there's evidence, I just wanted to throw this out there, that there's a lot of evidence of these kind of behavior in, um, in, in um, GBR. Um, reefs with moderate to large tides. So if you look at, um, this is a paper by McCabe et al, which looked at some of the, um, the hydrodynamics of, of Lady Elliot. And so you can see here the tides, again, fall. In this case, it has a shallow rim where the tides vary like this. Um, and you can see the black line is the water level that happens um, off, uh, in the reef. And then you can see the offshore water levels falling below. So you get this truncated, in, and if you zoom in, you get this elongated low tide. You can see another example is in one tree, so this is older work, but you can see that you get this really you know, rapid kind of flood and then this um, slow drain where water is, you know, you're cutting off the exchange of water with um, the ocean. So the implications for this, um, I mean there's clear benefits by the fact that we're, we're not, these reefs are not drying out, obviously that you know, the organisms that live on it are, are, are vo avoiding aerial exposure. But there's you know, very substantial drawbacks in that we're reducing the exchange of water with the ocean. We're extending this low tide period so we can get really strong 
I mean, very extreme variations in um, water quality, things like temperature. So this is, I'll talk more about this here, but you know, a lot of these reefs, you, know, you can often find you know, temperatures going from 36 degrees on average down to you know, 20, 28 or so. Um, also things like oxygen variations going from, we've done work here, you go from anoxic kind of conditions at night to 300% you know, kind of saturation level. So these are you know, very extreme um, uh, water quality kind of variations in these environments. Okay, so what we wanted to do now is, is in particular look at how in these type of environments, what, what is the role of, of tides in driving temperature variations and temperature extremes? Um, and so again, we focused on the, this um, reef at Talon Island. And so for this, we did another study. We, we deployed a, a large number of, of temperature loggers, about 64 in this, in this grid. Um, had a, you know, me measurements of the, the currents at all these sites as well. And we deployed a, um, a scaffolding on the, the middle of the reef where we had um, very accurate measurements of, of air-sea heat exchange with a number of instruments, um, like a weather station also. And what I want to just show is, um, if we take all this temperature data and we, we interpolate it, create a surface, um, you know, just to illustrate how extreme these, these temperatures can be, <clears throat> where what you're seeing now is, this is just showing right at about five in the morning, so, and the tides actually, the arrows show where the, the currents are, so the water start, has gone high tide, now it's draining off the reef. Um, this is the temperature, so it's cool, it's similar to the ocean. And you can see, even at, by eight in the morning, you're getting a lot of radiant, a lot of solar heating. Um, you know, already in these back reef areas, you know, going 34, 35 degrees. Um, and then, you know, this, this area back here, you're getting 40 degree water. Um, and so what you'll see then is now, so it's just gonna, it keeps heating and then suddenly you'll see the tide is now starting to rise, but it hasn't gone over the reef. And then right when it goes over the reef, it cools the whole reef down, you know, within like, a, like five minutes or so. so. So you can see right away that how temp, you know, the tides play an important role in driving temperature um, variations. In, the, in these reefs. And so um, one of the, the, the things that we did was we wanted to explore what, how temperature variations are generated by, by tides. And so this is um, some recent work, the paper in Science Advances. I just wanted, this is data from, uh, that, that motivated this, a lot of this work, uh, which is the Talon Island data. And so what you can see here is we have, this is, we did an experiment where we went from neap tides to, to spring tides. We measured the, how much heat was actually being exchanged into the, the reef waters. You can see it's pretty much constant the whole time. So this was in the dry season, very you know, no clouds, so very constant kind of daily heating. Um, but you'll notice here that the temperatures vary quite a bit. You know, you go from really small temperature, diurnal temperature variations of you know, say two degrees. Um, up to, you know, towards the end, about, um, you know, eight, eight or so degrees. And what it became apparent is that this really depended on the phasing of the tides in the, in the solar cycle. So this is what's shown here, these red dots along this line. This is when you have a maximum um, solar heating. So this is obviously around noon. But we know, as, as I'll talk about, um, the, the the, the moon, the lunar, what's called an M2 tidal cycle, which has a period of about 12.4 hours, is really the dominant tidal constituent that influences a lot of tropical regions. And so you all know that um, the tides are, aren't always occurring at the same time of day. They're sort of advancing forward, um, in this case, roughly 50 minutes a day. So the low tide period you know, initially starts you know, far from the, the middle of the day. You can see it starts to move towards, by toward the end, we're getting low tide lining up with um, the, 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 around noon, and so that's when we generate these these large temperature variations. So, um, what we wanted to do is is look at these kind of issues in more detail, um, and this is sort of a simple way to think about what I just just showed. Is that you know again the the dominant semi-diurnal tide has a period of 12.4 hours, so it's advancing. Low tide is advancing. 
Um, and you can think of what's happening is when we have low tide, periods where low tide lines up in the middle of the day, the water on the reef is, is shallower. So you can think about when you, it's easier to heat up. You generate much bigger temperatures when you heat up a shallow uh, water column. Alternatively, you can have the most cooling as well at low tide when that occurs at night. We get smaller temperatures if we have more water, high tide lining up with, with say noon and in the middle of the night. And the interesting thing is, you know, the Kimberley is sort of a, a really nice, clear example of this, is you get this sort of modulation in, in temperature variability, because there's such a consistent M2, really strong M2 tide. That, um, and what you can see is you get periods where, you know, these phases where temperatures lined up with low tide lines up with noon, and then this repeats every you know, 14, um, 14 days. Okay, so the other important thing, and by citing this and other, other reefs became um, apparent, is, is that mean sea level position is actually really important in terms of um, the, the magnitude of the temperature variations that we see, these diurnal temperature variations we see in the, the reefs. So, and a way to show this is if we just consider two, two reefs. They both have the same tidal variations, but we have a case where mean sea level is, is here, so it's a bit higher, and then we have a case where the same, the same tides vary from this point down, this is high tide, low tide. Um, and in the first case, so this is the high tide case, and then if we go to low tide, you can see in this case, if we measured the water level variations, um, we get this symmetric um, tide. If we have the case where the water level falls below the reef, or water gets sort of trapped up on these reefs, we, we get that truncated tide, tide I talked about, and, and this extended um, low tide. And so um, what this does is it really amplifies the, the, the temperature variations that you see. So you can imagine, it's pretty obvious, that in this case, just by the fact that the average depth of the water is, is deeper, that you should have smaller temperature variations um, than in this case it has um, a, a lower average depth. But also the fact that at low tide we're extending that over long, you know, potentially long periods of time, we actually didn't even enhance temperature um, variation. So one of the interesting things is it shows that for certain types of reefs where the tidal range is moving, you know, essentially falling below the, the crest at low tide, um, the temperature variations are going to be strongly dependent on um, present kind of sea level. Okay, so what we did is, um, you know, to, to explore these dynamics more generally is, is develop a heat budget model, which is won't go into the details, but essentially looking at the conservation of, of, of thermal energy and how tides um, essentially move water on and off these reefs. Um, and you can see this is sort of the model prediction of using. Talon Island as a case study, um, where you can see the black is the observations, red is the model. So you know, with this model, we can um, you know kind of accurately predict the, the temperature variability at the site. And um, you know, similar similarly, if we look at Lady Elliot, there's some good data where we can show that you know we can actually accurately predict these kind of temperature variations. But the, the main point is what are the implications? Um, so <clears throat> one of the things we wanted to do is look at you know, a number of reefs, um, about six or so globally, and we selected these based on uh, important criteria, those that had you know, very accurate survey uh, bathymetry, those that had good tide data and, and good temperature data. Um, and what we wanted to do is, is which we'll talk about, but look at the how tides drive the, the temperature variability in these environments. But what I'll talk about now is how you know, mean sea level position can be very important in terms of um, determining the, how, how these temperature variations will, will change. Um, <clears throat> so what we did is looked at you know, sort of a typical, um, this is more or less a mean kind of IPCC projection of about 70 centimeters of sea level rise to you know, an upper, kind of potentially an upper limit of about 1.5 meters. Um, and again, we know that you know, reefs can accrete, they can grow up against sea level rise, but there's a lot of evidence that, you know, with sea level rise, you know, occurring at you know, six, 10 millimeters uh, per year in the tropics, 
um, you know, slowing potentially slowing reef accretion rates by um, you know, slowing calcification and, and other kind of processes that we're just taking the the view that what happens if water level is, is higher by these amounts on these on these reefs. And one of the um, this is sort of a complex figure, but I'll try explaining um, is essentially the, the magnitude of these temperature variations really depends on, on mean sea level position and and for particular um, for certain reefs in, in particular. Um, and so what's shown on this this diagram is essentially it's a normalized temperature. So for a given amount of heat that's being added to the reef water, um, it's a measure of um, how big the temperature um, fluctuation. So you can see there's these areas down below here where we get really large temperature variations. And you can see that this parameter here, it's, it's actually quite simple. It's the, the depth of over the reef at mean sea level relative to the, this tidal amplitude eta. So if we go here, it's essentially the depth of the back reef. Here, this depth from mean sea level to the bottom relative to the, the tidal range. And what you can see is that, that reefs where, um, that are below this line are those where the, essentially the, the water level offshore is falling below the crest. And it's where we get you know, that tidal truncation, these elongated tides, um, and these large temperature extremes. And so for these type of reefs, and there's actually a lot of them, um, if, we, you know, if we, we get very dramatic nonlinear kind of um, reductions in temperature if we move across um, these, this threshold. So if we look at um, four you know, reefs that are like this in particular, um, <clears throat> you know, if we look at the, the current temperature, and again, this is not the mean temperature, this is the, 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 the range of diurnal temperature variations that occur. Um, you know, these reach up to five, you know, six degrees based on the literature. If we add 70 centimeters of mean sea level, you know, we can almost get a 50% reduction in the, the, the tidal variations. In certain reefs, you know, if we had a 1.5 meter, we can go from you know five, six degree variations down to, to one or so. So um, potentially, this is a you know quite a significant effect. Um, and <clears throat> there's some there was some a bit of media that sort of misreported a couple in particular that we were drawing conclusions for for to, for bleaching, which we don't talk about. We're just talking about the changes in the thermal regime. Um, and I think it was a lot of confusion between um, mean, where in this case the mean temperature is not necessarily changing, but the magnitude of the, the extremes and also the magnitude of the maximum temperatures that these reefs um, will experience. So just to a simple kind of scenario, this is what the result shows, we could have very well end up in scenarios like this on these type of tide dominated reefs, where we go from, um, you know, reefs that have um, you know, substantial temperature variations, if sea level rise happens, um, we can potentially can um, increase the mean temperature, but reduce the, the actual temperature variation. So, so in terms of the maximum temperatures, um, I mean, it'd be interesting to, to talk to people about, you know, what potentially the implications of this would be, that, you know, the long-term average temperatures, while they're gonna, you know, will go up, there's a potential that, that some of the maximum temperatures and the variations will be um, reduced. Okay, the last thing I just wanna talk just for about 10 minutes um, towards the end is um, just talk a bit about the, the bleaching. And so this is the role, essentially tides, and a very different role that tides play. Um, and, you know, in terms of, of, of warming patterns on regional scales. And so this is work that we're currently um, doing now. And so, um, as we know, you know, there was extreme kind of warming throughout Northern Australia. Um, this is showing, you know, NOAA's, NOAA's Coral Reef Watch, the bleaching alert in, in April. And you can see like this Timor Sea area, really warm temperatures. The interesting thing is if you zoom in on this, it's not, and I'll show, there was a lot of bleaching on the inshore Kimberley that was never picked up by this at all. And also in the, in the projections. Um, and so, in these environments, and one of the interesting things is these are environments that have major temperature variations, but there was you know, an offset of two degrees this, this year. And so there was extensive bleaching um, in this inshore Kimberley. Also, uh, work 
um, led by Amos that we're also um, involved with at, at Scott Reef. Um, as you know, there was a lot of bleaching in some of these offshore reefs. And so what I want to do is just talk a bit about how some of these ocean oceanographic processes appear to have really shaped the, the bleaching patterns that occurred over this area. Um, and so this is sort of just a, um, a summary that other people are going to be, you know, summarizing the, the, the bleaching data, but just want to show summaries of what the trends were. So we had, this is just showing some data that Steve um, Camo at UWA from some aerial surveys found that we had a lot of bleaching of these inshore reefs that had never been documented before. Um, but the mid-shelf reef areas out here, there was zero bleaching that was observed. Scott Reef, however, had you know, extensive bleaching, and the Raleigh Shoals had no bleaching. So we wanted to really understand what drove those patterns um, in, in the role that these oceanog oceanographic processes play. Um, so in terms of how oceanography can you know, influence temperature variations on this is regional scales. Um, and, and many of you are familiar with things like coastal upwelling, um, tropical cyclones, which in this bleaching event, like the Winston was um, thought to have a bigger role in the southern GPR in terms of mixing and stirring of the, the water. I'll talk specifically about tidal mixing. Things like internal waves can bring up cold water and, and there's literature that shows that that could be important. And, and regional current systems in terms of moving heat and convecting heat around um, in the, the ocean. Um, so the first um, major I think, point is that um, what, what really drove this event and drove it throughout Northern Australia was, was really fundamentally an atmospheric um, process. So if we look at um, the, the amount of air sea heat exchange going into the, the ocean, um, and this is an anomaly, so it's if we look at the, the, the deviations from climatological uh, predictions during, this is January, February, March, you can see this sort of really dark red areas, which is a lot of, this is, sorry, watts per meter squared, so there's a huge amount of heat from the atmosphere going into the, the whole region over very large scales. Um, and the interesting thing, I talked a bit about, you know, things that can, if we, break apart what's actually causing this. It's due to what's called shortwave radiation, which is essentially sunlight warming, directly warming the ocean. And so what the evidence kind of shows is that um, you know, this whole part of northern, northwestern Australia and northern Australia had very low cloud cover, anomalously low, and a lot of shortwave radiation warming this whole um, region. So it wasn't, so there's some, you know, been some discussion about maybe it's heat from because you know, there was a lag in terms of um, you know, the, G the GBR sort of bleached in yeah. was it February, and then um, this happened sort of late March or so. So it wasn't warm water moving through, it was just the whole atmosphere kind of process of forming the, the region. Um, so what we wanted to do is, is understand the role that you know, these finer scale processes that aren't really resolved properly in, in you know, a lot of satellite products in um, in, in climate models, um, and so we set up. A, we've done this a lot of a lot for a number of reefs uh, around the world, and, and a lot of reefs in WR. We set up a, a numerical model, and we're we're focusing specifically on this essentially six month period to look at the the, the heat and the, the temperature variability. So I won't go into the details, but it's essentially forced with a large scale ocean a model with tides and, and atmospheric. Um, forcing, but the thing I want to show is <clears throat> the model prediction. So we've done a lot of work now validating the, the, the responses of the temperature, and um, and one of the first things to show is this is so January. You can see um, time here, and so you can see the pulsing, which is essentially the day-night heating cycle. But one of the Important things is you can see this whole band of cold water. It, it's sort of at the mid shelf, so this is about you know, 50 to 100 meters depth. You can see you know, Scott Reef area, this is really warm, um, and these inshore shallow areas are extremely warm as well. And I should have paused, but you would have perhaps seen that there was a, a 
big pulse of cold water here around um, January 30th, in the early part of February. That was actually, we didn't really expect it. There was a, a really small kind of tropical cyclone um, stand that went um, through sort of the, the Pilbara, but the winds tend to be stronger on the cyclone on the left, left side. So there was a lot of stirring in, in cold water that, that you can see persists for a long period of time. So that seemed to kind of save um, Raleigh, Raleigh Shoals. Um, so this is just a snapshot <clears throat> of, of degree heating week. So this is showing, this is our own, you know, taking this um, the high resolution uh, product from JPL, in, uh, essentially NASA JPL, in, in driving degree, degree heating weeks, um, which we can then get in these inshore um, areas. And you can see this is just a snapshot, but you can see the observed with our, our models, and it captures generally the same kind of patterns where we get offshore. You know, warming um, these inshore warming areas, and then sort of cool water on the, the mid um, the mid shelf. And so, what we wanted to do then is take this model and sort of interrogate it and, and understand what um, actually was responsible. So, one of the the interesting things to start with is is tides, and this is the like a really beneficial part of the tides is that there's mixing up a lot of cold water on the on the shelf. Um, and a simple way to think about this is offshore you have a, a thermocline, so there, there's warmed water in the um, in an interface, and then you have cold water below that. Um, with tides, the, the velocities, they create mixing at the bottom. And so what has been a, you know, this is a kind of a common phenomenon that you find in areas with strong tides, is you get um, a critical depth where you get a lot of um, stirring of potentially cold water up to, towards the surface. This part is so shallow that it's well mixed. And so you end up getting an area where you get these what are called tidal fronts, where you get cold water um, at a critical depth. And so in this case, it was about the depth between 50 and 100 meters um, on the shelf. And there's been, I just pointed this out, that there has been some observations. This is really obscure paper, which, which hypothesized that this is this dark area is cold water. This is the, the Kimberly in a similar area that we, sh we showed, that this could be um, tidal mixing. But again, without a model, it's hard to really um, tell. So one of the advantages of having a model is we can look at two things. We can run the model with all the, the physics, with, with tides included, which I showed. And so you can see the relatively cool water. Um, this is now the average from January to March. So you can see colder water um, in this mid-shelf area. This, this cold part is due to cyclone stand. But if we look at what happens if we don't have tides in the model, this tidal mixing, um, <clears throat> what you can see is the temperatures in this whole region are, are much warmer by you know, at least um, uh, two degrees or so. And you can sort of see that here. This is a tidal front where you can see there's a lot of mixing and stirring up of cold water. So, um, and then should have mentioned that the last thing is um, Cyclone stand, as I mentioned, so it passed, um, I think the Raleigh Shoals is sort of here, so it passed a bit to the south. Um, it wasn't a large, it was a category one, category two, but just enough to really cool this whole area um, down. And so this is sort of a summary slide of, of you know, what we think at this point, what, what drove the patterns that we see. So as I mentioned, again, we saw bleaching, of these inshore areas, this no bleaching in these mid-shelf. Um, Scott Reef had a lot of bleaching and then no bleaching at, at Raleigh Shoals. And so um, <clears throat> it seems like what, what happens is we have you know, this large, very large scale of the whole region, a you know, thousand kilometers or so um, atmospheric warming. But then a lot of oceanography played an important role in driving a lot of the variations in the responses. So, Scott Reef, you know, warmed over the, you know, due to the atmospheric warming over the whole region. Um, same thing happened inshore. The Kimberley is actually there's even warmer temperatures because the, the water is, is shallow at 20, 50 meters depth. But we, this tidal mixing along the essentially the mid shelf, cooled these reefs and can explain why there was no bleaching. And then the same thing happens here. But then we also had cyclone sand that um, that sort of essentially spared. Um, uh, Raleigh Shoals. Okay, so just to 
um, summarize. So I just wanted to really talk about how um, you know tides interact with these reefs, and so there's a lot of interesting processes that occur. And so one of the things we did is you know come up with sort of a new understanding and, and model framework for how you know tides interact with these types of, of reefs. And with that information, this is sort of the foundation for you know, that work we talked about, looking at how these diurnal temperature extremes um, are generated in these environments and how sea level rise is, is important. Um, the work suggests that these particular reefs, that, that a slightly higher sea level rise can have a substantial effect on reducing diurnal temperature variations. Um, Tides themselves, as I showed, they're not only negative, so they can have an important effect um, in terms of stirring and, and mixing cold water, um, but it's at this really critical depth. Um, and, and cyclone um, sand, as I said, was um, occurred sort of at a critical time um, at the end of January when, when the bleaching was really developing, and so that sort of seemed to have, have spared uh, Raleigh Shoals. Um, and then just some acknowledgments, um, ARC, the Wamsi who I mentioned. Also, this, the, the work we did on the reefs was with um, the Party Jawi uh, Ranger Group and the community at, at Warren Point, um, Kimberly Marine Research Station, and then and Field Assistance. And then the last thing, um, just wanted to give a, like a plug, um, which will be coming out, um, there'll be a call for papers soon, but um, put, so I'll, editing a special issue in, in Journal of Geophysical Research Oceans that's focused on the oceanography of this El Nino event and, and, in, and how that affected um, you know, global, um, the global impacts on, on tropical marine ecosystems. So this should be, if anybody's interested um, in probably the next few weeks, it should be up and then we'll sort of take papers for about a, a year within this. So, um, just wanted to flag it. So it's an oceanography kind of driven, but I think the, the close connections with, with how the oceanography affected the, you know, these e ecosystems, and there's sort of a lot of, seems like a lot of work here, but then also overseas. All right, thanks.